Hello, and welcome to Growth Mindset Co. If you've ever felt overwhelmed by the complexities of FIDIC contracts, especially when dealing with intricate clauses like Clause 3.7 of the FIDIC Yellow Book 2017, you're not alone. Understanding the engineer's role in consulting, making determinations, and effectively handling disagreements can be incredibly confusing. In this video, we'll break down Clause 3.7 in detail, exploring its five sub-clauses and how they interlink with other parts of the contract, such as Subclause 21C. We'll delve into the different types of claims involved, the process of resolving disputes, and even walk through a flowchart that simplifies the entire procedure. My vision is to demystify these complex contract laws and clauses, making them accessible and understandable for everyone. I know that professional training can be expensive and out of reach for many students and professionals. That's why I'm committed to simplifying these concepts so you can navigate contracts with confidence without the hefty price tag. So if you're ready to turn confusion into clarity and master the intricacies of FIDIC contracts, you're in the right place. Let's dive in and start simplifying. Understanding Clause 3.7 in the FIDIC Yellow Book 2017 In the world of construction contracts, clear mechanisms for dispute resolution and project decision-making are crucial. Clause 3.7 in the FIDIC Yellow Book 2017 establishes the procedures and roles related to an engineer's authority in consulting with parties, making determinations and handling disagreements effectively. Here's a breakdown of each of the five sub-clauses within Clause 3.7. Clause 3.7 in the FIDIC Yellow Book 2017 includes five sub-clauses. One, sub-clause 37.1, consultation to reach agreement. Two, sub-clause 3.7.2, engineer's determination. Three, sub-clause 37.3, time limits. Four, sub-clause 7.4, effect of the agreement or determination. 5. Subclause 3.7.5 Dissatisfaction with Engineer's Determination Subclause 3.7.1 Consultation to Reach Agreement Subclause 3.7.1 of the FIDIC Yellow Book 2017 titled Consultation to Reach Agreement is all about the process the engineer follows to help the employer and contractor come to an agreement over a matter or claim. Let's break it down. Purpose. The main goal of this subclause is to encourage collaboration and discussion between the two parties involved, the employer and the contractor, before any formal determination or decision is made. Instead of jumping straight to a decision, the engineer is required to initiate a consultation process. This involves sitting down with both sides, either together or separately, and trying to guide them towards a mutual agreement. Why does FIDIC emphasize this? The idea is simple. Reaching an agreement is often faster, more harmonious and less contentious than having the engineer impose a decision. It's about giving both parties a fair chance to express their views and potentially resolve the issue on their own terms. This approach aligns with the spirit of dispute avoidance, which is a core principle in FIDIC contracts. Implications of this clause Promotes cooperation The focus on consultation over determination helps build a cooperative relationship between the employer and contractor. It's less adversarial than a decision imposed by the engineer and fosters better working relations. Time saving Coming to an agreement through consultation can be quicker than waiting for a formal determination or even arbitration. This helps keep the project moving without unnecessary delays. Legal and financial certainty. Once an agreement is reached and a notice of agreement is issued, the matter is resolved, at least in theory, unless some unexpected dispute arises later. This creates legal and financial certainty for both parties. Flexibility. The engineer's role is somewhat flexible in this subclause. They can consult with both parties together or separately, depending on what seems most effective. This gives the engineer room to tailor their approach based on the specific dynamics of the project or issue at hand. What if no agreement is reached? 
If no agreement is reached during the consultation period, the process moves on to subclause 3.7.2, where the engineer makes a formal determination. But that's only after the engineer gives both sides enough opportunity to talk it out. In short, subclause 3.7.1 acts as a first step in resolving claims or disputes through dialogue and collaboration, with the engineer playing a neutral, facilitative role. It emphasizes that both parties should strive for an agreement before relying on formal decisions. This approach not only saves time and resources, but also keeps relationships between parties more amicable during the construction process. When you say claims, what are the different type claims involved? In the context of the FIDIC Yellow Book 2017, claims generally refer to formal requests made by one party, either the employer or the contractor, to the other for an entitlement under the contract. These claims can be for additional payment, time extensions, or other forms of relief. The types of claims can be broadly categorized as follows. 1. Contractors' claims for additional time. Extension of time, EOT. This type of claim arises when the contractor believes that the time allotted to complete the works needs to be extended due to delays that are not the contractor's fault. Typical causes include employer-related delays, when the employer or its personnel cause delays, e.g. not providing access to the site on time. Unforeseeable physical conditions, conditions like unexpected soil issues or adverse site conditions that the contractor could not have anticipated. Changes or variations, delays caused by variations, modifications or changes to the scope of the work that add time to the completion of the project. This type of claim is covered under subclause 8.4 for delays due to employer actions and subclause 8.5 for delays due to unforeseen circumstances. Unit 2. Contractors' claims for additional payment, cost claims. The contractor may submit a claim for additional payment if it incurs extra costs due to employer-initiated changes, variations ordered by the employer or engineer that result in additional costs, unforeseen physical conditions, conditions at the site that increase the contractor's cost of performing the work, delays by the employer, for example, the employer failing to give access to the site on time or not providing essential data. Exceptional events, force majeure, events beyond the control of both parties like extreme weather, war or civil unrest which increase costs. Such claims are generally submitted under subclause 20.1 which provides the procedure for claims for additional payment. 3. Claims related to variation. Variations are changes in the scope of work instructed by the engineer under Clause 13, Variations and Adjustments. If the employer requests additional work or changes the design, the contractor can claim both time extensions and additional payment for this work. These claims arise from instructions by the engineer and are usually processed according to subclause 13.3 and 13.4. 4. Employers' claims against the contractor. Claims can also be made by the employer, typically when the contractor fails to meet its obligations. Some common situations include delay damages. If the contractor fails to complete the works by the agreed-upon deadline without a valid extension, the employer can claim delay damages as outlined in sub-clause 8.8. .8. Defective work. If the contractor's work is defective, the employer can claim the cost of remedying those defects or refuse to issue a taking over certificate until the defects are rectified. Clause 11. Breach of contract. If the contractor breaches the contract in some way, the employer may claim for the resulting damages or costs incurred. 5. Exceptional events claims. Force majeure. Both the contractor and employer can claim relief in case of exceptional events, also known as force majeure events, such as natural disasters, war or pandemics. These events are covered under Clause 18 and allow the affected party to claim an extension of time or additional payment if they are prevented from performing their obligations due to such events. 6. Claim for release from performance. Optional termination. Either party can claim a release from the contract if performance becomes impossible due to legal changes or exceptional events, under Clause 18.6.
For example, if the laws of the country change drastically and make it impossible for the contractor to perform its obligations, the contractor could claim to be released from its duties. Summary of Common Claims Time-related claims EOT, Delays caused by the employer or unforeseeable circumstances Cost claims Additional costs incurred due to employer actions, unforeseen conditions or variations Employer claims Delay damages, defective work or other breaches by the contractor Claims for exceptional events Force majeure related delays or additional costs Variation claims Time and cost adjustments for changes in scope all of these types of claims are generally managed through Subclause 20.1, which provides a structured procedure for how claims should be made, assessed and resolved. The process usually begins with a notice of claim, followed by detailed particulars, and then the engineer's assessment or determination, as detailed in Subclause 3.7. If the party disagrees with the engineer's decision, they can pursue further dispute resolution through the DAB, Dispute Avoidance Adjudication Board, Understanding claims under subparagraph C of subclause 20.1 in the Fittick Yellow Book 2017. When we think about claims in construction contracts, our minds often jump straight to requests for more money or extra time to complete the work. That's what subparagraphs A and B of subclause 20.1 in the Fittick Yellow Book 2017 cover. But there's another type of claim that's just as important, though less talked about claims under subparagraph C. So what's the deal with subparagraph C? Unlike the other two, it, it deals with claims that aren't about asking for additional payment or an extension of time. Instead, it's all about seeking other forms of relief or entitlements specified in the contract. These could be requests for clarification, adjustments, or interpretations related to your rights and obligations under the contract. These claims can arise from requests for clarification, relief, or adjustments related to rights, obligations, or interpretations under the contract. Types of claims under subparagraph C. While the specifics depend on the context of the project, common scenarios for claims under subparagraph C include 1. Interpretation of contract provisions. Sometimes there may be ambiguities or uncertainties in contract terms that need clarification. For example, the contractor or employer might disagree on the interpretation of specific technical specifications or performance requirements. The contractor might claim entitlement to perform the work according to their understanding of the contract and seek confirmation from the engineer. 2. Relief from certain contractual obligations. The contractor may seek relief from specific obligations due to unforeseen issues that are not their fault. For instance, if local regulations suddenly change, the contractor might request relief from complying with particular contract requirements that are now impractical or impossible to meet. 3. Adjustments Due to exceptional circumstances, exceptional circumstances that impact the project but do not directly involve delays or increased costs might also lead to a claim under subparagraph C. For example, a change in the employer's operational requirements might mean the contractor must follow different procedures or use alternative materials, requiring an adjustment to the approach without additional costs or time. 4. Requests for confirmation of compliance. A contractor might submit a claim to confirm that specific actions or materials used comply with the contract requirements. This type of claim acts as a protective measure, seeking formal acknowledgement from the engineer that their work aligns with the contract, thus reducing the risk of later disputes. Let's explore this flowchart to understand the process involved in resolving claims and disputes under Clause 3.7 of the FIDIC Yellow Book 2017. This visual breakdown highlights each step along with specific durations, guiding us through the process from start to finish. 1. Notice of claim by contractor to engineer. When the contractor encounters an issue that may justify a claim, the process begins with a formal notice to the engineer. This initial notice sets the whole procedure in motion. 2. Engineer reviews claim and initiates consultation. 
After receiving the claim notice, the engineer initiates a consultation process with both the contractor and the employer, aiming for a mutually agreeable solution. This consultation period should be completed within 42 days of receiving the notice and as out subclause 3.7.3. During this time, the engineer facilitates discussions to resolve the issue without further escalation. 3. Agreement reached. At this point we ask, was an agreement reached? If both parties find the solution acceptable, the engineer issues a notice of agreement, officially resolving the issue. However, if they can't agree within the 42-day time frame, the process moves to the next stage. 4. Initiating determination. If agreement isn't reached, the engineer proceeds to make an official determination. Under subclause 3.7.2, the engineer has another 42 days, starting from the end of the consultation period, to issue a detailed determination outlining their reasoning and decision on the claim. Bullet 5. Issuing Notice of Determination After issuing the determination, it becomes binding unless challenged. Both parties now have 28 days to review and respond to the engineer's determination. 6. Notice of Dissatisfaction Filed If either party disagrees with the determination, they can submit a Notice of Dissatisfaction nodi, within 28 days of receiving it, as stated in Subclause 3.7.5. However, if no nod is filed within this 28-day window, the determination is considered final and binding. 7. Dispute escalated to DAB, Dispute Avoidance Adjudication Board. Should a nod be filed, the dispute escalates to the DAB in accordance with Clause 21.4. The DAB then reviews the case and issues a binding decision. 8. DAB issues decision. After its review, the DAB issues a decision which both parties are expected to comply with immediately unless contested further. 9. DAB decision accepted. If both parties accept the DAB's decision, it becomes binding and the issue is considered resolved. If either party disagrees with the DAB's decision, they may escalate the matter further. 10. Escalate to arbitration for final resolution. If the DAB's decision isn't accepted, the final step is to move the dispute to arbitration under Clause 21.6. In arbitration, the issue is examined comprehensively, leading to a legally binding final resolution. This flowchart offers a structured, step-by-step -step approach to handling claims and disputes, ensuring clarity and fairness throughout. With each stage assigned specific timeframes, both parties have a fair opportunity to seek resolution within a reasonable period. This setup in FIDIX Clause 3.7 keeps the process transparent and efficient, guiding everyone involved through to a resolution. Thank you for watching the video until now. For the coming videos, these are the topics that we will cover. Process involved in case of Clause 20.1 A and B. Process involved in case of clause 20.1c how IDPs play a crucial role in contract management are IPCs considered as claims further insights into the sub clauses of 3.7 all right be honest did you feel those brain muscles getting a little extra workout? If you walked away from this video feeling like a contract ninja ready to take on the world, you know what to do, smash that like button. We've all had those cold sweat moments pouring over a contract, worried we missed some sinister fine print. But not anymore. By sharing this video with your fellow construction warriors, you'll be helping them avoid those costly, you had one job, mishaps. Just think of all the friendly ribbing you'll get to dish out next time Jim from accounting starts sweating over legalese. Oh no, the contract is too confusing for you? Didn't you watch that growth mindset video I shared? Priceless! Speaking of which, do yourself a favor and subscribe to our channel right now. We're constantly cooking up new clips to keep expanding your contract kung fu. Hit that bell icon too so you'll know the second a fresh video lands. With our hard-hitting guidance, you'll go from cowering at the sight of a multi-page agreement to wielding it like a samurai sword. Lawyers won't know what hit them when you start slinging terms like indemnification and severability like it's no big deal. So what are you waiting for? Like, share, subscribe, and stay weird. It's the least you can do after we literally saved your career today.